Joining us now is noted intellectual filmmaker, podcaster, and the author of numerous best-selling books, including Outliers, Blink, The Tipping Point, and his brand new book, Talking to Strangers, Malcolm Gladwell. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Malcolm, before we discuss uh, my small involvement in Talking to Strangers and the topic to which I've devoted most of the last eight years of my life, tell us about Talking to Strangers and how you chose the vastly different subject matter for the many chapters in your book. Well, I wanted to, uh, I was, I wrote the book because I was um, emotionally affected, moved by the death of Sandra Bland. She was the most, one of those uh, series of high profile um, cases in 2014, 2015, 2016 involving police and African Americans. And she's the woman, young woman who was pulled over by the side of the road in Texas, small town in Texas, and got into an argument with the police officer, and within three days she was dead in her cell. Um, and, it, you know, the whole exchange was captured on audio, and I listened, must have listened to it, you know, a dozen times, and just was struck overwhelmingly by how it was an example of kind of tragic miscommunication between two people who didn't know each other. And then I sort of realized that a lot of the high-profile cases that we have been concerned with in our society in recent years are about the same fundamental problem, that two people from very different worlds um, have an encounter and fail to see the truth about each other or understand each other. And so I thought I'd write a book about that. And that's, so that led me to all manner of different examples of, from Amanda Knox to Bernie Madoff to the Stanford rape case and to the one I suspect we'll be talking about on this show. <laughs> <laughs> well, you suspect correctly, uh, Malcolm. What made you decide that this was a topic which warranted revisiting all these years later? Well, you know, I, I, I had written about it in a very preliminary way for The New Yorker um, uh, some years back. And, um, and that was in, and I had just been struck by uh, how unexpectedly complicated the case was. And then, um, so it was in the back of my mind, and it did, it did very much seem to fall into this pattern that I was, be an example of this pattern I was interested in, which is how difficult it is to um, understand another's intentions, motivations. Um, you know, that it's really, 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 really hard to read people we don't know well, and we make mistakes. Um, and so that, I thought, oh, maybe I should go back and re-examine this, because like I said, I'd done a relatively cursory ex um, examination of it the first time around when I wrote for The New Yorker. And, uh, and so I, uh, in, you know, uh, I went back and descended into the enormous rabbit hole that is <laughs> That is the Sandusky case. Now you're not sure what the heck happened. Is that a fair analysis of, of your evolution of thought on this? Yeah, there's layers to, as you know, um, there are many, many layers to this case. Um, and layer number one is Joe Paterno. And, I, and that is like, I don't care what side of this argument you're on. There's no way Joe Paterno belongs in this conversation. He was, you know, uh, told about the incident in the shower, and he immediately referred it to his superiors, as he is supposed to do. So I don't I, I've always, even before I knew anything about this case, I was baffled as to why people were piling on Paterno. Um, so that's layer number one, and that strikes me as being, that ought to be obvious, and everyone ought to agree that Paterno was treated shamefully in the course of all of this. And um, his good name needs to be restored. Layer number two is uh, Spanier and his two top aides. Um, that's a little more complicated. And that originally, I wasn't sure how I felt. Now, as a result of writing this book, I am absolutely of the opinion that no member of the Penn State um, uh, leadership deserved the treatment they got. They should never have been... Uh, tried that the the, the, um, uh, the 
uh, prosecutors in the case behaved abominably with respect to them. I don't know what on earth they were supposed to have done. I mean, so I now feel like, and I, I focus on Spanier in my chapter. Sp- I think Spanier is um, is now is as much a victim as Joe Paterno is. Um, he's an honest, decent man who behaved the way we want our leaders to behave. And I am ashamed to be part of a society that tried to put him behind bars. Um, so that I'm absolutely clear on. Level three <laughs> is Sandusky, and I have no clue, no clue about that case. My whole argument in my book is that this is a case shrouded in doubt. It is not this. It is, um, it is the polar opposite of the Larry Nasser case. Larry Nasser and Sandusky are, on the surface, they appear very similar, right? Right. Pedophiles operating in a university context for years and years and years without being um, identified by or uh, without being uh, identified by uh, the administration or law enforcement. They're totally different. There was the, the, the victims of Larry Nasser, from the moment they were victimized, were going to their parents and saying, I was victimized. They were going to their coaches. They were going to anyone who would listen. I was victimized and nobody would listen, right? They would make contemporaneous um, they would tell people that it happened. They would enter in, they would write entries in their journals saying about what happened. I mean, that case, the, to the extent there are doubts, there are doubts in the people, the people who were being told, who were listening to the victims, decided that they didn't, either didn't believe them or, right. um, right. In this case, this case is totally different. This case is a mess. This case is like shrouded in all manner of mystery. And the, in, up to and including the num- the most important witness in the whole case, um, which is Mike McCreary, who, um, and if your date is correct, and I believe that it is, he saw something in the shower and spent weeks thinking about it. That is consistent with someone who isn't sure about what he saw. And McCreary himself says, I wasn't sure about what I saw, right? His words were right. twisted by the prosecution, in a way that I found so egregious, as you did too, um, that uh, uh, he sat and thought and mulled it over and didn't know what he thought and went home and told his father and his father's best friend, and they didn't know what to think about it either. You know, they too, the, Dr. Drainoff has a, has a legal responsibility to report cases of child abuse that come to his attention as a medical doctor. He did not, Right. Mm-hmm. Why? Because he also wasn't sure about what had happened. This is a case where there, were, there was a mountain of doubt. Now, that does not mean where you and I differ is that you, you come down, you say this mountain of doubt, your interpretation is that Sandusky is innocent. My position is I don't know. But for the moment, I don't think that matters. I think that the crucial thing here is to communicate to the general public that this thing is murky. And even the guy at the very center of it, McCreary, saw something and, and was so uncertain about what he saw that at the very least he took a month and a half to tell someone in a position of authority at Penn State about it. That is, you know, the kids, I give the, I have another chapter in my book on the Penn State, on the, on the uh, Stanford rape case. The, that case was discovered by two grad students are bicycling across the Stanford campus at midnight, and they see a couple on the ground, uh, and they think they're just making out, mm-hmm. and they get a little closer, and they realize that the girl isn't moving and the guy is, and that's all it takes. They run after the guy. Right. <laughs> they tackle him. Right. And they call the cops instantly. Right. right? McQuery does none of that. McQuery does none of that. Right. He goes upstairs, calls his dad, and goes home, and, right. spends, and then waits six weeks to tell his boss. So this case is hard. It is not open and shut. It's not Larry Nasser. It is something. It's his own animal. And um, I think that's evidence of something larger here, which is that um, these kinds of cases in general, this, or, or this something that our ability as human beings to see the truth about strangers, others, is, is, um, uh, is far from perfect. 
I'm curious. I know you've got space considerations, and it's a short chapter, and you did an incredible amount of research for a short chapter. But why did you leave out the part about a job opening the day before he just happens to go see the guy who could give him the job? Uh, I mean, interesting question. You know, there's a... I felt that I had given my readers enough information, enough evidence. What I was trying to do was to prove the case is hard and shrouded in doubt, and I felt that I had done that sufficiently by that point. Um, also, I, I'm, I, uh, and maybe this is the sense in which you mean it, I'm not sure. I mean, my interpretation of that, and I think that's a, it is an interesting fact, is, you know, this is incredibly awkward the subject of, if you're going to accuse uh, someone who is of Sandusky's stature in right. Penn State right. of something this, this strange and unusual and upsetting, and, you know, it must have tormented McCreary. And um, I don't think that psychologically and emotionally he could go to Joe Paterno and tell the story if that's the only reason for his visit. What I imagine happened is, he's like, oh, now I have an excuse to go and see Joe for something else. They talk about the job opening. He says, I want the job opening. And then he goes, I imagine at the end of the conversation, he says, oh, Joe, there's some, one other thing I want to talk to you about that's been on my mind for a while. It's a super upsetting, weird thing. I haven't, you know, I don't want to, you know, I feel like he needed my psychological reading. And this kid, everything I read about McCreary suggests to me that he was torn up about this um, five different ways. He honestly did not know what to do or think. Um, he saw something um, that upset him but was sufficiently ambiguous that he didn't do anything at the time. And then I honestly thought, I mean, I think he must have lost weeks of sleep. Okay, but so then why did he miss the, misremember the date, the month, and the year of the episode, Malcolm? He does, you know, so... On a cer- in a certain, there's two, there's a, it's, it's worth, I think, thinking about all the possible scenarios here. So certain things he does clearly remember. The campus was deserted. So that's an important part of, so he's not, it's not like this thing, there are certain facts about that evening that are, are uh, seared into his memory. The campus is deserted. He sees something that upsets him. He runs upstairs, he calls his dad, he comes home, he sees, talks to dad and drain off. Everyone's in agreement that that absolutely happened. So this is consistent with our understanding of memory that, that we might get the big emotional, from the standpoint of, if we, if we want to personalize someone's memory, from the standpoint of his memory, what matters is the emotions he felt and the actions he took. What doesn't matter is the date. So the same thing with Brian Williams. His memory is true of that famous incident where he says he was part right. of a helicopter that got shot down, and he wasn't. It was a helicopter behind. But his helicopter did come under fire. And what his memory, the emotional truth of his memory was that he was scared out of his mind. Right? That's what he remembers. So right. later he says, oh, I was scared of my mind. That must have meant that we were shot down. But in fact, no, it just meant that he was scared out of his mind and he was shot at. That's, those are the tricks our memory play on us. So I don't. I that's why I I'm so ready to believe your argument that it's December 29th, because I don't think there's any reason that we. Uh, first of all, McCreary plainly demonstrated he couldn't remember what day it was in the, in the first place. But there's no reason for us to hang all of this on the memory of uh, of McCreary in this case. He remembered what he needed to remember which was that he was very upset. Okay. The second thing that's interesting, though, here is um, that he, and this is, again, stuff I know from your reporting, you know, he was, the prosecution really did a number on McCreary, right? They ran, they took his story and misinterpreted it. Right. um, And, you know, there's a scenario here where they, they come up with the February date, in his gut, he knows, you know what, that probably that can't be right. But he's like, what choice do I have at this point? Oh, he's Where locked in. He's locked in. He's locked in. So, I mean, there's a version of this where right now McCurry is walking around saying, you know, 
I don't know when it was, but I don't think it was February. But I don't. I well, mean, he couldn't well, even. He couldn't even. He tries to say you've totally misrepresented my testimony. And does he ever say that publicly? No, he only says it in a private email, right? Right, right. The kid, I have incredible sympathy for McCreary. I mean, if he's been tortured about this uh, for years and years and years, now he, he has a, what seems like independent confirmation that his worst suspicion may have been true. So, yeah, I mean, I think in the way that that works, the cops coming to him with a kind of predetermined conclusion um, to what he saw allows him to allows him to say, yeah, okay, I think that's the way it worked. Um, it allows him to allay some of his, um, some of his doubts. Um, I mean, it's like a lot of this is, the bottom line on this case is that there, you know, we like to pretend when we reconstruct narratives about events like this that they're clean and tidy and um, easy to interpret. And, you know, this, this case is fundamentally proof of, how the opposite is true, that right. a lot of these things are unbelievably complicated. And you know, at the end of my book, I say that we need to be humble and cautious, um, humble in our, uh, cautious in our, how quickly we come to conclusions, and humble in the number of conclusions that we are willing to come to about strangers. And I think this applies here. Like, like I said, my, my focus is really on the Penn State administration, that we were way, 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 way too quick to come to judgment about um, uh, about the Penn State leadership on this um, and, uh, uh, and on Joe Paterno. Um, and in way too quick to kind of think of McCreary's evidence as this kind of cut and dried um, testimony, when in fact it's not, right? I mean, well, the chapter not. the chapter of your book is entitled "The Boy in the Shower." So let's talk about the boy in the shower uh, briefly. Uh, you are the first mainstream uh, uh, writer uh, outlet uh, to actually name the boy. How amazing to you, Malcolm, is it that this entire case that all these people got destroyed, hundreds of millions of dollars lost? Probably the biggest sports scandal of the century so far. It might not even be close. And the the epicenter of the whole thing has a has an ep, has, has a situation where no one testified at trial as the victim, and the prosecution told the jury that the identity of that person was known only to God, which was a lie because they knew it was Alan Myers. They didn't. They just didn't like his story. How amazing it t- is it to you that that not only happened, but that the news media showed zero curiosity about, wait a minute, where's the boy in the shower? This is the most highly publicized case of alleged child molestation in American history. There's millions of dollars on the table for whoever comes forward. It only happened 10 years ago. Where's the kid? How amazed are you at that ser- set of circumstances? Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it's bizarre. How come? So... Guy comes forward, says, I was the boy in the shower, and he never testifies at the trial. Like, just because the prosecution didn't like the story, you're right. That's weird. How do you, how do you prosecute Penn State leadership for uh, endangering the welfare of a child when you don't know who the child is? Right? Yeah. Or, I mean... The whole thing is kind of bizarre. The specific case which leads to the conviction of the Penn State leadership was this case, right, in the, right. In the beginning. Right. Um, and yet this case is somehow without a victim. And I think you're right as well. Like, the kid, where's the kid? If it's not Myers, who is it? Um, you would think it would be incumbent on the prosecution to have a good answer to that. And their answer, this is just another way, I just think, there are two things, two conclusions I have on this, and you probably have much stronger. One is, like I said, I thought the prosecution b- behaved egregiously in this case and continues to behave egregiously. They are still holding out the threat of, of, uh, of, um, of criminal proceedings over the head of Graham Spanier. That is, you know, outrageous. It is outrageous they're continuing to hound a... 100% perfectly innocent man in this case who did absolutely nothing wrong, who was a 
who was as fine and brilliant and uh, and honest and courageous a president that Penn State has ever had, the state of Pennsylvania continues to threaten him with that's outrageous number one. But two, the other thing is, man, did Sandusky have some bad legal representation? <laughs> I mean, good lord, like you know, like I said, I am. I should say once again, I do not. I do not have an opinion. I, did I find this case so confusing? I I do not have an opinion on his guilt or innocence, but I do know this. I hope if I ever get in trouble, I have a better lawyer than he did. Because, like, where, you know, you've got to agree with me on that. Like, oh, yeah. come on. No, no, I, I defended Joe Amendola, his attorney, for a while because I think he's a decent guy who was incredibly overwhelmed under uniquely bad circumstances. I mean, the trial was seven months after Joe Paterno gets fired. The entire community is being accused of enabling a child molester. They are invested in, in his conviction. Penn State is invested in his conviction. Uh, everybody is. I mean, Louis Free is chomping at the bit for his conviction so that he can come out with the Free Report, which will vindicate the Penn State Board of Trustees. The NCAA is thirsting for Free to come out so that they can punish Penn State football. The timing of this is all incredibly suspicious just because it all gets done just in time for the next football season. But let me tell you a story, a very, very small story. When I did my article for the, for the New Yorker on the Penn State case years ago on Sandusky case, I got into an email exchange with a reporter for Deadspin, the sports, who was oh. covering the case for Deadspin. Yeah. And uh, he really, 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 really disliked my New Yorker piece. Right. And so I actually sent him a very nice email because I was trying to engage him in a conversation. I said, you know, uh, if you believe, if you're looking for people, if you believe that Sandusky is uh, a child molester, and you're looking for people to blame, why does no one mention there was a, in that first case of the kid who showered with Sandusky, um, you know, where the case was investigated and Sandusky was cleared? 1998, the, 1998, 1998. Victim, so-called victim number six, who, whose it's, testimony sounds like he's a defense witness, by the way. But go ahead. Yeah. Um, that kid's case is reviewed by a number of psychologists and with Child Protective Services, and I believe I can't remember exactly. And I think two said they thought it was nothing, and one of the people said that she saw Sandusky, she interpreted Sandusky's behavior as, uh, as that of, uh, uh, a classic example of a pedophile grooming a potential victim. Mm-hmm. Um, if you are that woman... And you are uh, presumably an expert in this issue, um, and you come to the conclusion that a prominent member of the Penn State community um, is grooming victims for child molestation, um, and you you deal with the case and it goes away. Why do you never say anything? Right? Mm-hmm. I don't, what I didn't understand was why people were so upset for with Joe Paterno, even though right. Joe Paterno did exactly what he was supposed to do, turned all over the case to his superiors. And Joe Paterno, not, he's a football coach. He is not an expert <laughs> in pedophilia, right? right? <laughs> we don't, that, is, that is about as far from his area of expertise. So you're really upset about the guy who has no formal training whatsoever in this, in this area, even though he does the right thing. You're not upset at all with the expert in this but, case, but, one of the experts. But Malcolm, is, but Malcolm, Deadspin only gets traffic if it's attacking Joe Paterno. Because he's a I know, I know, but I tried to bring this up with him, and he now, I wrote him a long, very nice, thoughtful email, actually, in which I just said, what about her? Why, why don't we talk about, why didn't anyone go and talk to her and ask her why she never said anything? And uh, I never heard back from him. Of course um, not. I, I, and I, I think I know who you were talking to, because I think I've had uh, similar exchanges with the same person. I, I have to say, I had a very dim view of the news media before this case. I now have a, a view of the news media that is so low it can't get any lower because uh, some of the things that I have seen and experienced are just horrific and, and incredibly depressing. But I, I don't have enough time left in our interview to get into that specifically. I do want to ask you, Malcolm. You, I'll, you, I'll say one more thing before you. Yeah. Um, on this very point, part of the problem is there. So, you know, you and I are two people who, there is a long list of things that we agree upon and a long list of things that we disagree upon. Um, you know, I know what the kinds of things you've reported on the, uh, have, uh, in the past. You know the kinds of things I talk about. We have some political differences, but I don't believe that political or ideological differences should prevent people from 
having conversations, sharing information, and coming to uh, uh, conclusions or learning something about some new issue, right? It's, Amen. Amen. It's neither here nor there. Like, uh, I don't require that everyone that I uh, collaborate with, learn from, uh, read, do anything with, is someone with whom I agree with on all points. Um, you know, I happen to love Barack Obama. <laughs> I suspect you don't. But well, well actually, I, I, I used to I used to dislike Barack Obama, but now I'm not so uh, not so bad on him, okay. <laughs> considering what we okay. currently have. But all right, in, in our remain, yeah. in our remaining moments, Malcolm, yeah. uh, you, 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 I got a, a bunch of things I want to get to real quick. You, you say in your chapter that I make some very good points about the case against Sandusky being very flawed, but that you can't come to my conclusion that he is innocent. You've said in this interview that you don't know. Uh, yeah. you, you say that some of my arguments are convincing. Others are not <laughs> particularly yeah. convincing. Can you, can you give me an example of, of an argument I've made that you found to be f- fairly flawed or not convincing or, or, uh, or, or just not very good? No, uh, well, it's not a specific argument. It's simply this, that, um, and, uh, that I, I think I, I would phrase it a little differently, actually, upon reflection. Oh, good. I have a lot more respect for, um, respect is the wrong word, concern about uh, the complications of um, uh, the kind of emotional and psychological complications surrounding um, sexual abuse. So I would say there is a scenario that I could believe that could explain why it was so hard to get people uh, uh, to come forward and say they were victims of of, of Sandusky. Uh-huh. In other words, so do I, I, I get that too. I, I absolutely understand that. I do. Yeah. Um, and so you know, I there's a part of me that says you know in a in uh, in a in a relatively conservative community in uh, in uh, Western Pennsylvania, uh, for a young, uh, emotionally you know a young kid from maybe an emotionally troubled background, to stand up and admit that he was molested as a 14 year old is going to be really really hard. I, I, and I get that. That could explain why nobody would. Okay. Um, I, I know get, you get that too, but yeah, go ahead. Well, but here's here's the thing, Malcolm, and and I know you. I have incredible respect for what you've done here, and your intellect, and your your courage, and your in your thinking. But I fr- I don't think that you are are looking at this in in the normal way that you would, in, in, with all due respect, because this is the only case I can think of where the cover up was quote unquote proven before the crime was. Joe Paterno yeah. and Graham Spanier were fired. Tim Curley and Gary Schultz were essentially fired. They were indicted in the public mindset, in the media narrative. We've proven a cover-up before Jerry Sandusky even goes to trial. You have said there was no cover-up. You have, you have defended Joe Paterno and the administrators. If there's no cover-up, and, and this was a crime that was based Based, its foundation was the only way this happened was because Penn State, uh, some for some bizarre reason no one can explain, uh, decided to protect a former assistant coach uh, for these horrific crimes. No one can ever make that make any sense to me. But if the cover-up did not happen and the core issue, the core witness, the, the pillar of the case, Mike McQuarrie, is not reliable – then how can you have any faith in anything that follows? The analogy I use is, it's like saying, you know what, I agree that when it comes to the North Pole, that reindeer can't fly, and that elves aren't really making uh, uh, toys for Santa, but Santa still is real, and Santa still does come to everyone's house on Christmas Eve and leave gifts. That doesn't make any sense, Malcolm. Uh, well, uh, yeah, like I, I can't take that final step. I don't. There, uh, I don't know. I mean, I there is still a there is a scenario in my mind where that said that something um, happened between um, between Sandusky and these boys, um, and that it was took a long time to come to light. And I mean, let me back up and say, 
in this year in my podcast, I interviewed this guy who was a uh, an expert in police shootings, and he walked me through a particular. He's done. He's investigated hundreds of 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 police shootings. A conservative guy, by the way. Um, and he was walking me through this one case, and I did the whole episode about this one case. He said this thing to me that I will, I'm going to try to never forget. And he said, Malcolm, always remember this when it comes to these kinds of cases. Every case is different. In other words, you have to be willing when you examine a case to start from scratch and put aside all of your preconceptions about how they typically unfold. And I think that is way more true for the other side in this case, because I think everyone, what happened with this case is that everyone said, oh, this is a child molestation case, so this is the way it ought to unfold. Right. It, it ought to have a cover-up. It ought to have all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, victims that should be easy to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, but also I think it's true on the side that's a little more skeptical. We can't, you know, it is entirely possible that this, happen it's just a weird deeply okay. weird but do you not, I, do you I, not malcolm and look I don't, i'm not yeah. trying to put you on the spot and you know my yeah. respect for you and i know the toxicity of this case more than anybody but do you not agree that the actions of paterno and the three administrators that you have defended make a hell of a lot more sense if sandusky is innocent than if he is one of the worst pedophiles in the history of Pennsylvania. Would you agree, from an Oxum's Razor perspective, that everything yeah. fits better under the first scenario than the second? Do you agree with that? Uh, <laughs> you do agree with that, don't you? I Malcolm? think of them as separate. I think of like oh. I don't even understand. No, no, no. I draw a line between Sandusky and everybody else. Like I've told you, there's layer. Oh. Level number one is. Paterno did zero wrong. Level number two is, if you look a little harder, the case against the leadership, Spanier and the leadership, Curley and Schultz, Spanier, makes no sense. Uh, level number three, I don't know what as much as you know. It, you have convinced me that this is one hell of a difficult case. Yeah. Um, uh, but I cannot, I wrote a book called Talking to Strangers about how it's impossible to see into the hearts of strangers. I cannot see into the heart of, of Jerry Sandusky. I I admire what you have done, um, and I, I would encourage others to read through it and reach their own conclusions. I think that you have, if we come out of this case by saying it's an incredibly difficult case and we should never have treated um, Spaniard, Curly, Schultz, and Paterno the way we did, I think you have won. Do you agree, uh, do you agree Malcolm, that all of the environmental elements of a perfect storm causing a moral panic and a media rush to judgment, regardless of whether Sandusky is actually guilty, do you agree that those elements did exist to at least theoretically explain how a, an injustice of this magnitude could occur? Do you agree with that? Oh, sure. What I've just been talking about, Paterno, Curly, Schultz, and Spanier were the victims of a moral panic. I mean, they're like... Like, that's exactly what happened with them. Like, it's crazy. Like, you get so worked up about this that you decide you want to you want to pull you want to drag down the whole house. And the NCAA, the NCAA. I mean, we could you and I could spend another two hours talking about the complete absurdity of the governing body of intercollegiate athletics punishing Penn State because of the conduct of a retired employee of the football team. I mean. Is bananas as if what does this have to do with football? Right. I mean, right. it clearly has nothing to do with football. Right. That's to do with something far more consequential, which is you know whatever lies in the heart of of of, of Jerry Sandusky. So like there are <coughs> the idea that they with a straight face the NC two A could have jumped into this case, um, and the Louis Free report. I mean, that's another whole right. pile of crap. Right. Like. Pile of so, crap, absolutely. Um, Malcolm, last question, because I know you got to go. Uh, you, you said already in this interview that you are confident that uh, over time, others in the media will revisit this case. I don't agree with that, although I think you writing a chapter in your book is an opportunity for that to happen. Uh, why are you more optimistic about that than I am? And are you willing to do anything to try to help in that happening? Well, sure, I've. I mean, I, I, I'm going to talk about this case in 
um, and your work uh, when it comes up on my book tour. And I've written a book which will be read by many people. Already I've heard from people who have read early versions of the book, and uh, they're a hell of a lot more skeptical about this case, I think, than they were going in. Um, but uh, I'm, in, I'm optimistic because I feel like over time there is an inevitable... Um, I feel like the truth surfaces over time. Common sense over time surfaces. Uh, sometimes it takes a little longer than other times, but um, and unfortunately, and I, people who are in the vanguard of that process of helping common sense surface uh, pay a price. You've clearly paid a price, um, uh, uh, but I think you're going to live to see to feel um, some measure of vindication. Like I say, if the result of this is simply that people come up to Curly Schultz and Spanier and say. Um, you were done a terrible disservice. We are profoundly sorry. Um, I, I think I think you would have won. I think you need to take that as a victory. Um, well, I, I haven't had very many victories over the last eight years, Malcolm, but I have to say uh, your book is, a, is at least a small one and, as you say, a, a measure of vindication. And I, and I thank you very much for having the courage to at least take an honest look at this. Uh, please make sure, uh, listeners, that you, you read Talking to Strangers. Malcolm, thanks so much for your time, and let's please keep in touch. Great. Thanks, John.